Make the choice to begin anywhere in your life, and the journey has started. And along the way, be inspired. Listen to the stories by joining the president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, on The Journey. Lately, we've all been paying close attention to our health. We're checking in on our family and friends almost daily. We cannot forget about these loved ones, especially those who have ongoing treatments that started before this pandemic. This afternoon, we're speaking with a breast cancer survivor and patient. We will hear her journey to empower women's health. Hello, my name is Dr. Wayne Frederick, and my guest today on the journey is my surgical oncology partner and friend, Dr. Laurie Wilson. She is a cancer surgeon here at Howard University, and she's also chief of the Division of Surgical Oncology and the program director of the General Surgical Residency at Howard University Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Thank Wilson. Thank you so much for having me. Good. So first, let's start with um, where you were born. Uh, <laughs> um, obviously, when both of us met, one of the things that I was fascinated by is the fact that uh, as an American citizen and, and the daughter of a service member, mm -hmm. you were actually born out of the country. I, yes, I was. And, and so tell, tell us where, we, where was that and what was that like? So I was um, born in Landstuhl, Ramstein, Germany. My father was a longtime Air Force serviceman. He retired out of the military after 35 years of service. Um, for me, I was in uh, Europe for, until I was the age of four, and then remember my my younger years spending time at the Air Force Base in Springfield, um, Massachusetts, before we ultimately landed in Virginia, um, Portsmouth, Virginia, to be exact. Have you ever been back to Germany to visit the base? That's a great question. I actually have been. Um, one of the things that I was able to do when I was in high school was to travel back to Germany. I know those are a few years ago, um, <laughs> but I was able to go back and see where I was born and to, to tour that area. So you eventually uh, ended up in Norfolk. Uh, how many siblings uh, did you have and what was it like going to school at that time in, in Norfolk? Um, so I have one brother who is uh, three years older than me. I am so absolutely proud of him. He is actually um, part of the Sheriff's Department. He's the number three guy in charge of uh, defense uh, and um, helps to train the sheriffs in that local area. I grew up in I, going to public school and I'm a big proponent of public school. I had a great upbringing in having a very diverse background, diverse group of teachers. I grew up very close to Hampton University and Norfolk State University. So a significant amount of the uh, members of my community actually had gone to uh, HBCU. So from a very early age, I was um, supported by HBCU lovers who really um, supported uh, the uh, HBCUs. And for us, Howard was the preeminent. We used to, it's very interesting, when I was in high school, I don't know if you know this, but I was in the band. I was a flag carrier. And <laughs> we used that. to come to the Battle of the Bands when they used to be, they used to have <laughs> Battle of the Bands for um, high school um, bands. And I remember the trips that we used to come to DC and to come to Howard and to come to the games. Phenomenal and was one of the reasons why I thought coming to DC was gonna be so important to me. Now in high school or sometimes in middle school, stu students have a, an experience either with a teacher or a project or a class that really says, you know what, uh, this is where I wanna be and as far as those dreams may have been away from that seven-year-old Laurie Wilson, what in high school or, or in that middle school experience mm -hmm. really made it clear for you that this is what you were going to do? And then uh, as you answer that, why Georgetown at the time? What led you to Georgetown University? Sure. Um, I would say that um, the experience, and it's an experience that I sort of look back on, but I took for granted when it was there. I actually had a PhD who taught my biological science class when I was in high school. And when you think back now, um, her name was Dr. Saunders. 
And the fact that I actually had someone who was a PhD doctorate who was teaching my, my high school class was completely lost on me at the time. But the fact that there was such excellence in our um, midst, and there were people who were reflected in my community, who looked like me, who did it with such ease. And then um, I, I would have to say that um, when I decided to go to uh, college, I decided that I wanted to make sure that I wasn't too far away from, from home because I wanted to be able to drive back and forth just right. in case I needed a meal or I needed my laundry <laughs> done. But I didn't want to be too close. So right. three hours away um, and, in D.C. And at that time, D.C. was um, a very um, unique, rich, um, and still is, rich community that had um, my best friend who actually went to Howard. And so um, I wanted to come to, to D.C. because it was very familiar, but Georgetown gave me an opportunity to have some different experiences and ultimately um, became my home, not only for undergrad, but for medical school as well. Right. And obviously, being in D.C., uh, at Georgetown, you then decided that you wanted to pursue a general surgical residency, mm -hmm. and, and that's where uh, we met. We were both interns together. Uh, why Howard um, Hospital's general surg surgical program, and did you have an experience uh, during your years at Georgetown that made you feel that this was the right place to come and do your, re your surgical residency? And you know, I, I, am, I am definitely grounded in a very spiritual belief that your, order, your steps are ordered. And I um, think back on these very pivotal moments in my life that if I had missed those moments, my life could have been totally different. So I think back to being um, in my third year um, of medical, my fourth year medical school, I was in the library studying. And one of my friends came by and said, you know, there's this lecture that's going to be given by a surgeon who's coming from Howard. And I was like, oh, should I go? Should I not go? I haven't quite finished my module yet. But long story short, I decided to go. And that person that I met that moment was Dr. LaSalle LaFall. And as you know, he is the patriarch of surgical oncology. Um, and he is the reason why I am who I am today. I truly believe it. Um, you were, uh, as you know, were as influenced as I in his scholarship and his research, his ability to um, be this amazing renaissance uh, person on top of being this excellent surgeon. So I met Dr. LaFall, um, decided that he was who I wanted to be. And you know, you have to uh, understand that along the way, I had this great desire to be a surgeon but never had any role models that really spoke to who I wanted to be in life. I knew I wanted to do it. I knew I had the support, but I didn't have quite the vision, and he gave me the vision. And so I was lucky enough to um, spend one of my senior rotations with him in medical school, and it was all done. I was, I was, it's, I was solidified that after, um, that experience that Howard was the only place that um, I wanted it to be. And usually it's a list of, you know, 10, 15 programs. And even though I interviewed at over 20 programs, I actually ranked one program, and that was Howard. I didn't <laughs> want to be any place else. It wow. spoke to me. It was who I, I knew that um, uh, I, I, where I needed to be, to be the best possible uh, elite surgeon, and that being under the tutelage of Dr. LaFall, and then looking around and seeing the reflection of excellence in everyone that was here, um, I knew that this is where I needed to be. So subsequent to your general surgical residency, you decided to do pursue surgical oncology as a Dr. LaFall, and so you went out to the John Wayne Cancer Center with uh, probably some of the Best, best surgeons uh, in the world who in, in many ways um, have kind of written the books mm -hmm. on some of what we do today in terms of standard practice. And so that obviously gave you a, a significant uh, level of interest in breast cancer. 
And what was that experience like in your fellowship and what about it mm -hmm. really made you uh, feel that this group of patients w were a group of patients that you wanted to connect with uh, career-wise? Uh, I think that um, one of the things that I find so important in research is that we spend um, time understanding uh, the what's and the why's, the how's and the when's. Um, research does that for me. When I had the opportunity to um, decide where I wanted to go for um, surgical oncology, likewise, I interviewed at um, a myriad of programs, but there was one program that was very um, aligned with who I wanted to be, and that was the program at John Wayne. And it was because of the um, uh, Dr. Donald Morton, who at that time was the um, medical director, um, he was a melanoma surgeon and a surgical oncologist, but he was a ultimate um, researcher. And he was the person who I knew that I would learn how to do really relevant um, clinical research that had to do with disparities. And so I had the opportunity to learn under him, to learn under Armando Giuliano, how to be a surgeon, how to be a, um, a scholar, writing, publishing, and how to be a researcher. And while I was there, I was lucky enough to to do two things which um, had never been done before. I was the first African-American um, uh, candidate that they had ever taken into the program and the program was long standing. And the second one was I was the administrative chief, so that means I was the chief of chiefs um, for that, that program which was selected because of um, not only academic, surgical, um, but research excellence. And while I was there, I had the opportunity to um, actually uh, write five grants, and all my grants were funded. And if, as you know, funding is tough. It's tougher now. But at the, the time, as a, a fellow, having the ability to learn how to write grants, to be in a place to be successful, to learn grantsmanship and to be able to bring it to the next um, place that I ultimately um, landed was very key to what I wanted to be and um, sort of ticked all the boxes for me. And so subsequent to your fellowship, uh, you uh, took a job at the University of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. we, we both were there uh, for a short period of time together. And then um, I had the difficult task of uh, convincing you to uh, leave there and to come to Howard University, and, and uh, fortunately you did. Not too long um, after that, uh, you know, a few years after that, in 2013, you had the unfortunate diagnosis of uh, a breast cancer. Uh, t leading up to that, at that point, I believe your, your son was about 18 months. Mm -hmm. uh, talk me through, you know, just type the kind of diagnosis and from a you know, from a patient's point of view, given the clinical knowledge you had and the fact that every day you were seeing and taking care of patients and giving them advice, what, what, what were the sequence of events that led to that and, and what were your feelings and thoughts at, in those first few moments? Right. So I actually was diagnosed um, just after having my son and finishing breastfeeding. We're told that breastfeeding is an important part of healthy uh, immunity for our babies. I was doing all of the um, things that I felt were important. After I stopped breastfeeding, what I, one of the things I found was that one of my breasts didn't go down. And for me, that of course was a red flag. I ended up getting a biopsy um, and having imaging done in both my breasts. And what I found was that I actually had a breast cancer in both breasts. Two different types of breast cancer. One was an invasive lobular, lobular and the other one was the, the devastating sort of triple negative. Um, I subsequently um, underwent chemotherapy radiation, a bilateral mastectomy, which is removal of the breast on both sides. Um, I had removal of my lymph nodes under my left um, arm. And ultimately, um, at the end of uh, that treatment, um, was found to have little to no, I think it was three millimeters of, of cancer left. So for me, that was, in one breast, it was a complete response, which means all of it went away, and the other breast, um, a very small amount was left. Mm -hmm. And so 
No, I, I might add that Ken, Ken Burns did a PBS special that followed you uh, contemporaneously <laughs> um, to your experience. It, it was aired on PBS. It's called Cancer, uh, the Emperor of Maladies. So I, I, just to interject, you also were in front of the world, as it were, having your story told. And, and what, what also factored into doing that, making that decision as well, as you tell the story about you know what what your experience was like i think one of the things that is so important to me and how i see my um the opportunities in life sometimes opportunities are thrust upon you and you may not choose them for yourself but you have to use them to the best of not only your ability but what god puts in front of you and your community and so um it was an opportunity to tell my story and do it authentically, let, letting people know that, that there's something outside of just doctor's visits. Um, one of the most touching moments, I think, in that uh, series is the moment where I shave my hair. And um, it's the family sitting around and the barber comes over to our house and my husband has his head shaved, my brother-in-law has his head shaved, my son didn't have much hair and so he, 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 he um, sort of played a little role in that. And it was about showing the world that cancer just um, is a part of every crevice of your life. It, is an it was an opportunity for me to show the voice of who I was and see who I am as a black woman, as a black woman going through the same sort of struggles, having an 18-month-old and wanting to see him go to college, wanting to see him go to grad school, making sure that um, you know I have a husband that loves me and a, a family that I adore and wanting to spend as much time in my life with this amazing um, life that I've been given. Um, I think back to when I was seven. This was not the life that I knew that I was gonna have. Every day for me is a blessing. Um, I have amazing friends like you. I have amazing opportunities to travel and to speak and to give my opinion and to also give the perspective of voices of people who don't oftentimes have the opportunity to have a voice. And um, in my role as a surgical oncologist, you know, God, you know, I, I have a diagnosis that I understand very well. But I had um, life experiences before this that changed my perspective of how I was actually going to take on this diagnosis. My mother was diagnosed with lung cancer when I was a um, fifth year in, in um, my general surgery residency. Um, and she, um, I took off a year uh, in between residency and my fellowship to take care of my mom before she died. And one of the things that I knew um, was important that I was going to do differently was to actually be a patient. One of the things that I would have to say is that I regret being trying to be my mother's doctor mm. and not being there for her as a daughter. And so I decided that I was going to be the patient in this, that I was going to have a team that I trusted. I had um, friends who I knew were going to um, guide me through this and that I was going to trust them in um, helping me make these decisions and that I had a family who um, was going to, to walk through this journey with me. And so, um, I'd have to say that it is um, sometimes daunting uh, to know um, some of the um, outcomes. It is daunting to know um, that the diagnosis um, is a diagnosis um, that can be um, ongoing. But what I think is important is that I'm able to um, share it with my community. I'm able to share it in audiences across the world and around the world. 
and that I've been able to hopefully change the perspective of many black women about how they deal and understand breast cancer. And, and one of the decisions you made was to continue uh, operating, taking care of patients, um, also continuing to do charitable mission type work all around the world for which you've received uh, a UNESCO award mm -hmm. um, that, that we're very, very proud of. So with that in mind, what, what, what led you to do those things? You, you, you traveled all the way to Ethiopia and spent a week uh, providing care. What is that like? And, and, I'm, and I'm sure, knowing you as well as I do, you've done that sometimes when you weren't probably feeling your best self physically. What, what, why, has, why was that so important to keep that going? What I know about the populations of patients that I've taken care of, I've been to Mozambique, I've been to uh, Nigeria several times, um, Sudan, I've been to uh, Ethiopia. And there is nothing like being in a place like Nigeria and a woman walking up to you and thinking that you're home, talking to you in their native language like you are part of their tribe. Now, after your initial treatment uh, that you had, you then had some big decisions to make about what were the next steps in your treatment. Why don't you tell us about kind of what that journey in terms of your treatment and where that stands today? Sure. Um, after I had my uh, initial treatment, uh, we know that a lot of the care is really in follow-up, making sure that I was seeing my, um, my medical oncologist, making sure I was seeing my surgeon. Um, ultimately, in uh, 2019, um, one of the most um, difficult uh, things is that my cancer came back. And for me, it was an important decision about what am I going to do next. The goal, of course, um, is to make sure that we are taking care of the cancer in a way that will make it dormant, which means that it, it stops in its place. And we figure out, unfortunately, unfor um, um, or unfortunately, uh, th that we I had the diagnosis of metastatic um, breast cancer, but. Um, figuring out what is the um, treatment that was going to stop my cancer and also being a part of a clinical trial. Um, it took a clinical trial for my disease to be stopped in its tracks and actually to get better. And one of the things that I think is so important, especially as um, black women, is to think about clinical trials. When we look at clinical trials today, only about 17% of the clinical trial um, recipients are actually African American. Mm. And so it is important that we utilize every opportunity to be at our best because I have hope today because I looked into a clinical trial that I'm hoping will be something that will stop my cancer for a very, very long time. One of the things that I always have to do for my Howard family is always to ask the last question, which is why Howard University? Especially when you look back at what brought you here, all the things that you've been through, you, you're now the program director advising uh, young people in their residency who are trying to go on to fellowship. Mm -hmm. What would you tell the seven-year-old Laurie Wilson as to why she should have come to Howard University for undergrad, med school, and her residency? So if I had it to say, the legacy is there threefold. So there, uh, you know, you can't ask me one question and get just one <laughs> answer. Sure. But the legacy, the fact that I can be connected to surgeons such as Dr. LaSalle LaFall, Dr. Burke Syfax, Dr. William Vittori, um, Dr. Charles Drew, and that I can change, um, actually connect my lineage in my uh, uh, surgical career to those amazing surgeons knowing that their technique is passed down to me and that uh, in a small way, I'm able to pass that o down to the uh, next generation of leaders, the diversity um, that we're able to provide. I have a diverse group of people that are around me that challenge me, like you. You know, you challenge me, you give me opportunities to, um, to 
push past what my um, what I think are my my potential weaknesses and to show me that there are strengths that I never thought I I I would have, and I I would have to say number three my voice. Though I'd have to say that my education I um, I had a tremendous education in medical school and in undergraduate, my voice. I developed here at Howard. The fact that I am the woman I am today is because the people who listened to me and thought that just because I was in the room that I was valuable, that everything that I had to say had nothing to do with my pedigree, had nothing to do with where I was from. It had everything to do with Lori. Lori, did you, did you, did you, Prepare for this case today. Are you? Are let me show you what um, the next steps of this procedure is. Let me tell you how this should be. And then ultimately, my very last, um, if I could tell this story, my very last case was with one of our longtime loving um, uh, cardiothoracic surgeons, Dr. Oswald Warner, and I did a one of the more most difficult procedures that we could do. We don't do it as often, AAA, aortic aneurysm. I did an aortic aneurysm with him, and um, I was able to assist in it equally um, as he, as a cardiothoracic surgeon. And at, we closed the patient. Patient did well and ultimately left the hospital. But what he did was to, he was like, come with me. He took me to the next room, and Doctor, um, one of the um, s senior surgeons was in the room, and he said, I want to tell you how phenomenally she did today on this case. And there's nothing like having someone that you idolize tell you you have value. And so I'd have to say that there are many reasons why I, I've come to Howard. The fact that I'm part of a legacy, the pack, fact that I have a voice, and the fact that I have the ability to be parts of, of wonderful stories and to help the next generation of young people um, do their thing. But Howard, there's no place like it. And Excellent. I'm, I'm blessed to be here. Thanks for being here. My guest today was Dr. Laurie Wilson. She's a surgical oncologist, chief of the Division of Surgical Oncology, and the program director of the General Surgical Residency at Howard University Hospital. And most importantly, she's my dear friend and somebody that I certainly admire. And her journey is one that I think all of us should glean something from. I'm Dr. Wayne Frederick. Please join me next time on The Journey. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.